All right, everyone, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the large staff, especially Megan and Professor Yule, for convening this. Happy to be here, and that's a great presentation this morning. So we're going to move into some very familiar terrain, at least in the current political moment, which is immigration. For those of us in the immigration space, it's been a very eventful year. As I told my students, I've been doing a lot of stress eating, late nights, you know, every day there's something different, and we're going to be taking up a small piece of it and introducing concepts of equity. And we're going to be looking at specifically how equity and kind of critiquing the current inequity in the system of immigration enforcement, and we're going to be looking at how we can introduce equity by focusing on the kinds of contributions that non-citizens make to the United States. So, just to give you an overview of what we're going to cover, first a little bit of background in terms of what's happening in the area of immigration enforcement in the United States, some of the contextual factors that are relevant to our <coughs> core argument. And then we'll be moving into why we believe it's important for there to be greater equity in the space of immigration enforcement. And I have that word equity highlighted in blue, not only because equity and equity is a core part of this, Symposium, but also because in immigration law, equity has a particular definition, or it's used in a particular way, right? So when we're talking about inequity generally in the symposium, we're talking about structural fairness, right? But equity in the immigration space not only, not only means structural fairness, but it also means positive factors, right? So I'm sure we've heard of that. Like what equities are there in the case? In the immigration space, it means, well, what are the positive factors in that non-citizen's case that should let them remain in the United States? So we'll be talking about that. And then we have really two core questions that are at the heart of our paper that we're presenting, and we, of course, welcome pushback and feedback and all kinds of reactions. The first question is, what are the kinds of contributions that non-citizens make in the United States that should insulate them from removal? We understand very generally that, well, if you contribute to the United States, then you should be allowed to stay. But we believe that that is under-theorized, and so we're trying to create a typologies and categories of contributions that are undergirded by specific theoretical justifications. And then the second question is, okay, so we have this space in our policy, in our laws, where discretion, where these positive factors matter, but how is criminalization impacting that space itself? So that's the second question that we take up in the paper. And then, of course, we're going to address some of the limitations that we believe are inherent in our own framework, and then some questions that we have for all of you. All right. So moving into the background. So it's no surprise that many of you know that there's a very sizable undocumented population in the United States. Estimates range from 11 to 14 million, maybe more, maybe slightly less. And at the same time, there are limited enforcement resources, which is to say that even if the government wanted to, it simply couldn't, with current appropriations, remove all of the persons in the United States who are unauthorized, who have entered without documents, who have overstayed their visas. And as a function of that, what's happened over the last 15 years or so is that the executive branch, which is responsible for enforcing immigration laws, has engaged in a type of de facto priority setting uh, in the immigration space. So even though the law itself may, the, the INA, the Immigration and Nationality Act, may say, well, okay, if you're not undocumented, you're deportable, the government, through the exercise of discretion, through considering, considering these different kinds of practices, is engaging in a type of normative priority setting. Folks like Adam Cox and Christina Rodriguez have written about this, and this is where kind of the core of a lot of immigration policy exists now, is in the priorities of the executive branch sets around who should be prioritized for removal. Also, in at least under the Obama administration, there was a strong emphasis on the importance of that power to set priorities. That the government itself had said, we don't want to go around and deport every single person. We want to retain the discretion to decide who is worthy of remaining and who should, in fact, be expelled from the country. That was argued in the Arizona case. And in fact, I think most administrative law scholars will say that discretion is a critical part of any kind of administrative legal system. So that's one aspect of the background. The other aspect, of course, which is relevant to our paper, uh, I suspect relevant to Professor 
Vasquez's presentation is that there is a broad and long-standing trend of criminalization of migration and migrant communities in the United States. What does this look like? First of all, there is robust criminalization of migration-related acts, right? So if you enter the country without documents, that is a misdemeanor. If you enter the country in whatever status, you get deported and then try to come back in without papers, that's a crime. That is vigorously prosecuted. And we have some statistics about that I'll show you in a moment. There are also collateral consequences of immigration, uh, of criminal activity. So if you are a green card holder and you commit a crime, you will very likely have an immigration consequence, namely you could be facing deportation. And then, of course, another aspect of this criminal immigration nexus, which many scholars refer to as crimmigration, is the growth in immigration detention. It's another example of criminal justice norms and practices being imported into the immigration system. All right, so just a little, one recent development, of course, is that there has been a shift in some of the removal priorities. So whereas, at least under the Obama administration, per a November 2014 memorandum, there were some of these normative priorities that had been identified around who should stay and who should be expelled. That's kind of shifted, such that there's a very small category of people who are now, well, it's not even clear who under the current priorities is worthy of remaining, right? And there's an expansion in terms of the people who are priorities for removal. And then you can certainly say, based on the statements made by the president and by the attorney general, that kind of the, the politics of criminalization, immigration detention, there's a doubling down that has happened. These are just a little bit some statistics around criminalization of migration. It may surprise you to know that uh, recently uh, the number of federal criminal prosecutions that are immigration related prosecutions is more than half. So it's taking an overwhelming part of our federal criminal docket, immigration related prosecutions. Again, these are largely illegal reentry cases, sometimes unauthorized entry. They may also be harboring and some related types of crimes. Um, and again, the AG earlier this year identified immigration criminal prosecutions as a priority. So this is the state of affairs. And against this backdrop, our argument is that we need to create more space for equity in the immigration enforcement system. And as you might discern, or I think it's implicit in what I just presented, there is deep inequity in the immigration enforcement system and how does this play out? Well, of course, for one, because of this robust criminalization, the space for discretion, right, to consider positive factors, to consider fairness, is just a lot smaller. And that's because a lot of these criminalization trends include mandatory bars, things that basically take people out, completely out of consideration for different kinds of protection. So the, the category of people who are actually able to make their claim and say, I have these positive contributions, I deserve to stay, is getting smaller and smaller. And in the way in which these laws are applied and these factors are applied is that there's relatively limited weight that's being given to these contributions. Factors. And conversely, a disproportionate emphasis which is given to criminal and even administrative immigration violations and a lot of this is fueled by kind of race-based presumptions of criminality and dangers. So what we're trying to add to this conversation is when we think about fairness in the immigration system and the factors that should lend towards keeping people in the United States, we believe that part of that project of injecting equity into immigration enforcement is deeply analyzing the kinds of contributions that non-citizens make to the United States. All right. As it stands right now, we kind of intuitively understand and a lot of immigration policies and scholars have said, well, if people are contributing, then they should stay. But we really don't have a deep understanding of what that means. There's a lot of clarity about that. There's not a clear amount of transparency. Nor is there consensus about the kinds of contributions that should match. All right. And so we're trying to move that conversation forward. And before we present our vision of what it should look like, let me just show you the kinds of things that have already been articulated in memos from the government, laws in the past. All right? And you'll see that a lot of these are vague, which is probably why we're trying to make it a little bit more concrete. So there's a number of memoranda that have been issued by DHS that basically say, these are the category of people, even though they're deportable, that you know maybe we shouldn't deport them. And they say persons with ties and contributions to the community. Another one says people who have, are 
are of value and service to the community. Really unclear, right, what that means. Uh, persons, then there are some very specific carve-outs that we see in different parts of the law. Some of them are statutory, some of them are others. For example, persons who cooperate in the investigation or prosecution of crimes, criminal activities. So this particular kind of visa that you can get if you're supporting uh, the prosecution of a crime, if you have a crime victim. This is one kind of contribution that's very concretely recognized in the law, right? My contribution is I am helping law enforcement go after a criminal and investigate and prosecute a crime. That is a contribution that is recognized. Another is military service, right? Military service is a type of contribution that under immigration law matters in the law in different, several different places, right? Other places, not, you know, kind of as like factors, positive factors, you occasionally see history of employment, right? Having a steady job, contributing to the economy, is seen as a positive factor. Property ownership. There's some other language from some memos that suggest that some degree of deference should be given to people who are engaged in lawsuits asserting their civil rights, uh, people who are engaged in, in labor, protected activity. The reason that I have an asterisk here is because these memos aren't affirmatively endorsing these as good contributions. They're basically saying that while you're doing it, we're not going to deport you, right? It doesn't say that it's going to insulate you indefinitely from removal. So this is kind of the landscape, but again, it doesn't give us a clear sense of the typology of the contributions that matter. So before we get to our argument around the kinds of contributions that matter, let me present some of the theories that underlie this position that contributions should matter to this discussion of uh, equity and uh, immigration enforcement. Of course, equity is a moral imperative that Professor Yule uh, was one of the framing considerations that she, she offered. Of course, we need to create equity and by contrast, try to eliminate inequity as just a basic moral imperative in society. But beyond that, there's some specific theoretical justifications for why these kinds of contributions should be taken into consideration. So um, there's a number of scholars who advanced this theory in immigration called eusnixi. Are there any Latin speakers in the room? Because we may need a, a technical uh, consultation here, because we made up a Latin phrase, which may or may not be grammatical. Right? <laughs> so, moment. so there's this idea that I let Shakar, Angela Banks, and other people have put forth is that, okay, even if you're undocumented, you may have a claim to membership in the community based on your rootedness. How long you've been here, how many kids you have, how big your family connection is in the United States. What we're proposing as a theoretical justification is not simply looking at rootedness, namely how long you've been here, but a different kind of connection, which is what are the inputs that you put, in, put into society. And so we literally made up this Latin phrase, which may or may not be grammatically correct in Latin. We won't check it. It's basically looking at the connection is not so much from your mere presence and the duration of the presence, but the types of inputs you're putting into society. And so that's one justification. It's a modification of the use next principle of connections or earned citizenship. Another theoretical justification is just basic inequity theory, inequity in exchange. And the idea is that Persons who are engaged in a reciprocal relationship, persons or entities, are going to be looking at their inputs and outputs, and if they feel like the bargain is not fair, they're going to adjust their behavior. Right? So if a non-citizen is in a relationship with the state, and they feel like, well, I'm putting in a lot more here, and I'm not getting anything back in return, namely an assurance that I'm going to be safe from removal, then at some point their input level is going to shift. Right? And similarly, kind of rational choice theory tells us that a person's decisions about civic engagement and support, specifically around supporting the government are going to be driven by rational self-interest, at least to some extent. And you know, public choice theory doesn't squarely apply here, but when we think about functions that non-citizens can engage in that are in some ways supporting the government, right? For example, military service, there is a space for thinking about it needs to be in their self-interest to do that. Right? And the government has to create some kinds of incentives to, to ensure that people are going to continue engaging in that kind of behavior. So that brings us to our <coughs> chart. <laughs> Again, we're going to be welcome critique. So this is just a, a, a very basic typology of the kinds of contributions that, in our view, should be weighed when deciding who should be allowed to remain in the 
United States. And I think you could probably create more gradations of this, but this is just the start. The first, uh, you'll see the type of contribution of persons who have made sustained economic, social, or cultural contributions to families, communities, or society at large. But these are contributions that don't happen to affirmatively or indirectly support government functions. And we'll give you some examples of those in a moment. The theoretical justifications are the ones, I, some of the ones I just mentioned. And our position is that these kind of contributions, at a minimum, should be weighed heavily against removal, right? So if somebody has made this kind of contribution, they happen to be undocumented, then our position is that should weigh heavily against the removal. And then I think there's qualitatively a different kind of contribution for people who, are, who have made substantial and or sustained contributions that support a government function. And again, we're going to give you examples in a second, so this is going to be more concrete. Or Alia will in just a moment. I'm going to hand it off to her. Uh, and again, there's different kinds of more, uh, theoretical justifications for why that matters. Specifically, these theoretical justifications are right, incentivizing behavior by non citizens that's going to support your government function. And our position is that, again, that should be a factor that weighs heavily against removal, but it may in fact be something that should fully insulate a non citizen from removal. So for example, you'll see in a moment that one of the factor contributions that would go under here is military service. And that some have advanced the position recently that if you are engaged in military service on behalf of the United States and you're a non-citizen, that no matter what you do for the rest of your life, you should be insulated from removal because of the nature qualitatively of the contribution. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it off to Paul for this second part. Um, so I'm going to dive a little bit more into these two specific categories that we've identified for contributions. So the first one we find as sort of sustained economic, social, or cultural contributions or everyday contributions. So those include contributions to benefit one's family, their community, or society, not necessarily those contributions in the second category that specifically support some sort of government um, and one thing that we really wanted to make clear, too, that it doesn't just include economic contributions. Um, one thing that you all have probably heard a lot about is the DACA program, so Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. A lot of emphasis is placed on these um, incredible kids who have, you know, 5.8 GPAs and are doing amazing things. And one, one thing that I think is not um, emphasized as much is the DACA recipients who make these sustained contributions to their families. For example, with DACA, you can get a work visa that allows people to get driver's licenses. And one DACA recipient who I worked with um, brought her her um, sister, who was a U.S. citizen and had various physical disabilities, to medical appointments regularly. So those are contributions that I think are important to emphasize, but aren't highlighted as much. And it's the same with economic contributions. That's really a lot of the focus um, in the priorities that Jayash also um, identified. And one of the things that we want to get at with these sustained contributions is that it's not just, you know, these categories, it's really any sort of contribution to your family and to um, society more broadly. Another one, and not just supporting your family and U.S. citizens and green card holder family members, um, is really su supporting the community at large. So there are a lot of undocumented activists or folks who have been ordered removed who are doing amazing community organizing, um, and political work. And that, again, is not an economic contribution, but it's an important one that we believe should be recognized. Um, another one, and Jayash can speak to this, credit for it, yeah. this example a little bit more, um, it, are these other intangible contributions. And Jayash thought brilliantly of the example of a, of a subway performer, of someone who you know, maybe is undocumented um, and has been living in this country for many, many years, and every day has been performing on the subway platform and contributing to the happiness and joy of, of everyone's daily commute. Um, so that's something that's a sustained contribution, right? But not something that we're, we traditionally would think of as um, a positive equity. In <coughs> so that's one category. And then the other category that we really were thinking of, especially um, in the changes in the current administration, in terms of criminalization are those contributions that directly support, either directly or indirectly support some sort of government function. And one of them that Jayash mentioned was reporting a crime to law enforcement or actively participating in the investigation or prosecution. So 
So that's already, um, that's a contribution that in some ways is already rewarded through U visas and T visas, folks who cooperate with the prosecution or the police um, are given uh, a certain type of visa status and then ultimately, ideally, that leads to citizenship. Another one, another example is reporting workplace violations and pursuing work-related claims. And we'll get into a little bit um, how that's criminalized later. Um, but that's just people who are injured on the job reporting um, the injury and then seeking workers' compensation. And the purpose of that really is to make the workplace a safer environment. Another really important one that um, is to serve as a sponsor for the Office of Refugees and Settlement. Um, several years ago, and this is an ongoing issue, there were thousands of unaccompanied minors who came primarily from Central America um, and came to the U.S. alone without a parent or guardian. And the way that setup worked is they go through the Office of Refugee Resettlement, or OOR, and someone in the country has to sponsor them. And so these sponsors agree with an agreement with, with ORR to shepherd this kid through um, the removal process to make sure that they go to court and appear for all their appearances and finally, another one that we mentioned um, is military service. And there's another, uh, there's a specific program that's called the Military um, Special Special National Interest Program that actually targets people who are not citizens to participate in military service based on certain skills that they have. A lot of it is related to language ability, but other skills as well. So those are the two categories of contribution. And then, what we're going to talk about is how these contributions have been criminalized. And right here, we're defining criminalization in different ways because their contribution isn't always directly criminalized. So one way that we're looking at it is direct criminalization, which is the very contribution, the act that the person is contributing is actually criminalized. Um, another way that it's criminalized is indirectly, and that would be either corollary uh, or resulting act that's criminalized. Um, and criminalization makes that act impossible or it makes it difficult to accomplish. So that wouldn't be necessarily direct criminalization, it would be some, somehow tangential. And then finally, one point that we want to mention, we kind of talked about this, is a separate criminal activity, however minor, really overrides the importance of that of one contribution. So one issue that, that we just talked about was that any sort of criminal conduct sort of trumps these other positive equities. And that's something that's already occurring kind of throughout the system, um, but something we should be aware of also. So this slide really focuses on the criminalization of those sustained everyday contributions that I talked about. Um, the doctor recipient driving, driving the family member to the doctor performer. And so how that is criminalized is done in both directly and indirectly. One way is through law to criminalize the very act of soliciting or seeking work. And then indirectly, and Jay has touched on, touched on this a little bit, um, are laws that um, relate to illegal reentry and smuggling. And he showed that chart earlier that over 50% of federal criminal prosecutions are actually immigration which is an enormous number of the federal criminal docket. Um, and then one other way that it's, it's um, criminalized in, kind of indirectly is through these driver's license laws that are state specific in that um, folks with, who are undocumented and also actually who have certain lawful status in the United States can't get driver's licenses, which then, you know, if they're driving without a license, leads to uh, entry to the criminal justice system and then into the deportation system as well. Um, so this focuses on the criminalization of the <coughs> sort of contributions that support government functions. And this is really what we're focusing on, I think, and something that we really want to highlight with this article, is that this is a change that we've seen in under the new administration. Um, there was a great article in uh, that NPR did with ProPublica about um, a law in Florida that makes it a crime for folks to seek workers' compensation using a fraudulent identification. So what happened was that folks who were undocumented and reported workplace um, safety issues and injuries and sought workers' compensation were then uh, 
charged under this, this Florida statute um, because they used a false identification in doing so. Usually they didn't present the false identification uh, for the claim, but rather it's presented through their employer. So that was just one way that reporting certain workplace safety issues actually led to a sort of criminalization of those people. And another issue that is very important and that immigration advocates have seen more of um, is the criminalization of ORR sponsors. And those are the sponsors that I talked to, who I talked about who are uh, shepherding unaccompanied minors through the immigration court process. And there's actually a memo from the current DHS Secretary John Kelly um, in which he identifies these ORR sponsors, um, especially those who are actually parents of the children as priorities for possible prosecution for smuggling, uh, for actually smuggling their kids over into the United States or for um, possible removal. Um, and then another one is uh, our folks who, I mentioned the example of people who seek U visas or T visas. Those are people who um, are reporting either crimes or reporting trafficking. And they, if they have any sort of criminal conduct, and this is something, again, that's happening a lot more, are being sent to immigration enforcement. Uh, the practice under the previous administration was really kind of to allow them to move forward with the process despite the criminal conduct and their, or their criminal history. And now that's kind of changed. There's a big shift towards uh, making that a much bigger hurdle now for people to obtain U visas and T visas. And then finally, there's, um, there's some uh, research and also various articles about the lack of consideration um, of folks who have post-traumatic stress disorder or other issues after um, military service and who commit crimes um, because of that, and then who are later sent to deportation proceedings. Um, so even people who uh, have served in the military cannot get citizenship for that very reason. So, so those sorts of contributions under this big dragnet of criminalization um, aren't even be recognized, and those people are also being sent to deportation proceedings. So, um, we just wanted to highlight the broader impact of criminalization, um, and one is that it just really significantly narrows the space for people who should be considered, um, uh, or brought in really as members or citizens of the United States, because again, once you criminalize certain or once you uh, have criminalized certain activities and people have that sort of criminal conduct, it really outweighs the positive equities in this immigration framework. Another issue that's really been highlighted a lot by immigration advocates and the media is that survivors of domestic violence and different crime victims are now reluctant to report crimes because they're very concerned about getting funneled into the deportation system or arrested. And then another thing that I think is just important to point out is that criminalizing these types of contributions, especially the, the ones that support government functions, is fairly new. Um, this going after ORR sponsors is something that's very new. And so we don't really know the impact at this point of, of what that means. So of course we want to talk a little bit about the limitations of this particular framework. So one, uh, is that contributions are really difficult to define. Uh, we, we highlighted sort of priorities that the prior administration really embraced in immigration enforcement, but as Jayesh mentioned, those are very vague, right? It's not clear what, what really counts, what connections count, what contributions count. And there might be a reason for that because it's very difficult to define what, what contributions should count. And what we really want to do is broaden it, as I said, beyond those merely economic contributions. It should be something also not tangible, something related to contributions to the family and the public at large. Um, so our questions really, and hopefully you know, you all have questions about this or thoughts about this, is how do to, where do we draw that line? And which, which contributions should be weighed more than others? And then another issue is this sort of, um, pitfall that we want to avoid of good versus bad immigrants. And this is, was definitely an issue under the previous administration. President Obama had famously 
said, you know, we want to focus on families, not felons, um, in, in, their, in his uh, immigration priorities. And really not recognizing that, <laughs> that folks with families also might have a felony conviction. And that's something that we don't really want to fall into that pitfall either, right? We don't want to um, completely uh, wipe someone's positive equity out merely because of some sort of criminal conduct. And then another issue is just this sort of critique of earned citizenship or membership, one of the theories that Jayash mentioned. Um, and part of it, one critique actually is that it, it assumes that immigrants and non-citizens are coming here with some sort of moral deficit. And they need to gain these positive equities in order to justify their membership in, in this country. Uh, and that is a valid, <laughs> that's a valid critique and something that we definitely maybe is a limitation on this framework in that people need to contribute something in order to justify um, their presence here. Um, and yeah, we just had a final question. Does this framework move us away from this paradigm? Is it too far away? We welcome discussion about that. And then finally, we have the full chart <laughs> of, of the the vision and what we talked about. So we have the two categories of contributions here. Um, and then examples of them, and then what we discussed, the direct criminalization, and then the indirect criminalization of each of those contributions. And then finally, the theoretical justifications um, for treating those contributions as positive equity. Okay. I'll leave this up here. You all have questions or thoughts about that? Yes. Or, 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 or questions are we good for the next speaker? You said that the oh. Would you rather move to the next speaker and do joint questions or questions answered? How much time do we have to Um, We're trying to end around two. We have about an hour left. So I'm not sure it does move us away from that, sort of going back to your last slide, does it move us away from the, the moral deficit? In fact, if you're focusing on other contributions, at least I have read your paper, I guess I'm not sure there was a paper yet, but uh, I mean, I'm sure you're writing it, but there's no draft that I could have read, so my defense. Um, the, uh, in, in my mind, it sounds like you're asking, are there enough contributions to justify adding to this person to society? Is this person a net benefit to society? Is that, and if, if that's not the standard, what is the standard? I mean, if you're asking, you're, you're focusing on the contributions, right? But how, it makes me think, well, how much contributions were enough? Is the idea that you have to have enough contributions so that you're at least is contributing as much as the average citizen? Is it the idea that you're contributing enough that you are a net gain to society? What, what standard are we applying to the contributions? Yeah, I think we can start with that. So there is this basic premise that they are, they are enough, providing that benefit to society, right? I think the challenge is, and you've alluded to this in your question, is what's the baseline comparison, right? Is the baseline comparison your average citizen, right, which are actually typically held to a lower standard, or should they be held to a higher standard because there's some kind of deficit that they're overcoming because of, particularly for the, those people who are here without authorization, right? And so very much in the existing framework, there's an assumption, the legal framework is there's this assumption that because you had that original sin of entering without inspection or overstaying your visa, you need to compensate for that with like exceptional kinds of contributions. I think our position generally in the paper is that you shouldn't have to, right? Uh, that you can have enough of a connection and, and a, a level of contribution that will put you essentially at parity with your average citizen and justify your, your membership in, in the community. It might be usually to, to, to spell that a little more in the sense that you know, faculty members, you know, we don't, we, we hire, we, we're stuck with, Deadwood like me sometimes, where the faculty stuck with, I have tenure and can't get rid of me, right? But, but when we hire new people, we want to hire people that are better than the average, right? We might think that the average citizen in this country is actually, may not be enough benefit. I mean, the, we, the government spends about $21,000 a year per citizen, and the average citizen, just in pure fiscal uh, framework, and the average citizen doesn't pay $21,000 a year in taxes over their, over their life cycle. Uh, 
Uh, and so, I mean, it, it, I'm just trying to figure out if your framework, if you're asking, not this isn't necessarily the right framework, but if you ask, if the question is, do, does the immigrant enrich the rest of society, giving sort of the entitlement to society, because other ordinary citizens have tenure, we can't deport native born, we shouldn't deport native born Americans or native black citizens. Do we, is it, it's not immediately obvious to me that it's an average standard versus a net benefit yeah. yeah, I think um, I think you're definitely looking at it like an economist. I think one of the things, and it's hard. Is there any other way to look at it? I know, right? Mm -hmm. you know. That's a good way to look at it. I know. Um, and I, I think that's a good question. I think, I, I, I don't know if we necessarily will come up with an answer. I think one thing that really the article is trying to highlight is um, that, you know, undocumented people and, and people who are non-citizens aren't compared to this net baseline of of a U.S. born citizen or someone who has citizenship, especially when it comes to criminal conduct. And what this administration is doing is expanding what criminal conduct is and expanding this sort of um, overly punitive model to encompass more people who are undocumented or not citizens, and then to take away those positive equities that they have. Um, so I think that's one thing that the article really seeks to highlight is that, um, and this is something that's been highlighted in case law as well in, in various Supreme Court cases, like Padilla that recognized that uh, non-citizens who are in criminal cases need to be advised of the immigration consequences of criminal convictions because it's so punitive how criminal convictions are treated in the immigration system. And that's not something, I mean, that's a whole other conversation about how criminal convictions are treated for people who are citizens. And it can be over over punitive, of course, with collateral consequences. But for people who are non-citizens, It's, it's really interesting. I, I think, I guess, I see a really fundamental tension I'm having trouble wrapping my head around and resolving. So we kind of, the paper could be about sort of which contribution should matter, right? And yeah, I think that that's an important paper, right? Um, but then there's also that sort of how do we weigh the criminalization part of it? And you can almost have those things working at cross purposes with each other. So the contribution that might most matter might be the fact that folks are working and they're contributing in an economic way. Contribution shouldn't be limited in that way, but we might weigh those as the most important contribution. But from a criminalization model, that might be the most troubling thing that an immigrant can do, because if you kind of take it out, I don't necessarily believe this, you can make the argument that they're taking away what should be entitlements to citizens by working in jobs that citizens could work in, right? And so that, the criminal penalty and the how much we weigh the criminalization might be higher for that higher contribution right. that's canceling out right. that contribution <laughs> to criminalization. And so I'm just having real difficulty in terms of if we believe that there it is appropriate to criminalize activities that, immigrate, that um, undocumented individuals engage in in the United States, then wouldn't the criminalization, those things that are criminalized, um, be in parallel with those contributions in the sense that those contributions are the greatest are the things that you should want to criminalize the most? It can. I don't think it necessarily has to, but I think the example that we're, and that's precisely our point in a way, is that that we are trying to define the, the contributions that matter, but then we're seeing this disturbing trend that some of the contributions that are most frequent, right, employment, are the ones that are being targeted the most. And it's actually a double-edged sword because on one hand, the government will weigh it as a, in some areas of immigration law, they weigh it actually as a positive, right? Well, you've been working, right? Yeah. But then in other areas of immigration law, they'll, they'll, they'll use it against you. And so it's almost as if, if you're a non-citizen, you're kind of in a no-win situation where you, you can't do anything, right? To kind of build up those positive factors. So, I mean, I think you're, the way you framed it initially is one of the tensions that we have with this paper is it, is it really, should it be two separate papers? Because I think there could be a paper on what are the contributions that matter, because that requires its own kind of deeper theoretical justification and kind of creating a typology, and then a separate paper around how criminalization is messing with these contributions and how do we weigh criminal conduct or the criminal dimensions of what could be positive conduct in the balance. 
And so I think that's something that we're struggling with. And then what's the answer to that? How do we respond to that criminalization? Right? Is that criminalization of something that's good, like, or is it justified? On what grounds? There may be some broader societal justifications for some of these criminalization trends. But then there's others that are harder to justify that seem to be more punitive and race-based and targeting immigrant communities. So we really need to kind of tease out on a case-by-case -case basis to really separate out those kinds of criminalization that are maybe appropriately neutralizing contributions and those that are doing so in a more problematic way. Certainly, I think we think one of those constraints is criminalization itself, right? I mean, that's inhibiting a lot of activity that could be seen as positive, right? You know, the driver's license is one example, but because of rapid criminalization in some parts of the country, if we treat social engagement, right, engagement with civic institutions as a positive fact, right? But if you're afraid to go out and about because of criminalization, then that's going to inhibit you from moving that, right, to the column for you. So, but certainly, yes. I mean, it kind of goes to the question around what's the standard, right? Should, if the constraints are placing non-citizens in a position that they really can't engage as much or as deeply as a citizen, then sure, yeah, perhaps the threshold should be lower. Right. Or at least moderate somehow. Right. Because you have, you have status-based constraints and you have conduct-based constraints. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're talking about like, inability to access civic um, goods and services, that's a status-based constraint as opposed to a person having committed an unlawful activity above and beyond being unlawfully present. And when they receive a conduct-based um, constraint. And yeah. Yeah. No, and I think that those are, we, we should incorporate those into our framework. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think the idea of constraints is really important. I think and Jay has pointed out that a lot of, a lot of it is criminalization. I think recognizing the constraints would also require the system to recognize 